Hello and welcome from the City of Westminster Archive Centre. My name is Susie, I work at the Archive Centre and I've got my colleague Bowie here with me from Charing Cross Library. Uh, he's co-presenting with me behind the scenes and he will also be moderating your questions in the Q&A. This evening we are really happy to have Professor Ian Christie here to tell us all about the history of London's Panorama Theatres. Ian is Professor of Film and Media History at Birkbeck College um, and he's also delivered a series of brilliant lectures for Gresham College. And that was actually how I first came to learn about Panorama Theatres and I've been fascinated by them ever since. We actually hold quite a lot of material on the Panoramas at the Archive Centre, including a number of playbills and posters. However, from looking at these alone, it's really hard to grasp what the experience would have been like for the audience um, to have been immersed within these colossal painted vistas. So having Professor Christie here with us tonight is a wonderful opportunity to learn more about these spectacular entertainments and understand the real impact they had on Victorian audiences. Before we get going, um, just to let you know that the talk will be between 40 to 50 minutes. It will be followed by Q&A, where we will be taking your questions. Do you feel free to send us your questions at any point during the talk? The chat feature has been disabled, so please type all your questions and comments in the Q&A and we very much look forward to seeing them. Well, that's all from me. I shall hand you over to Ian. Thank you very much, Susie. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, wherever here is. <laughs> I'm in my study in North London, um, and I imagine you're in a variety of different places. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to actually try to breathe a bit of life, as Susie said, into the relics that we have of panoramas. Um, it was Ralph Hyde, who was uh, an archivist, he worked at Guildhall Library, who really, I think, made us all aware of what, what a legacy there was of panoramas. He staged an exhibition at the Barbican in 1988, and I've borrowed his title, Panoramania, because it's a wonderful title. The exhibition, he said, was about the art and entertainment of the all-embracing view. And that's really the neatest definition of what a panorama was, an all-embracing view. Not many people know much about them at the moment, um, because there are none that you can see. <laughs> you have to reconstruct them using the kind of documents and evidence that's in, for instance, Westminster Archives and many other collections. And you've also got to bring your imagination, um, because we live in an era which is kind of distant from the era that gave rise to panoramas, but you know, um, they're still very much with us in lots of ways. Now I'm going to try and um, move my slide on. Always an interesting moment. There we are. <laughs> first, first slide change done. I mean, just to remind you that this is a long history. Panoramas are really only one part of it. Um, it goes back, for instance, to painters like Thomas Gainsborough, who developed a kind of um, view, what he called a view box or a show box. And, and there is one of these that survives. It's, uh, it's um, on show uh, at the BNA still. And of course, we also live in an era when VR, virtual reality, is also a part of our world, not for everybody, but uh, you can have an expensive Oculus Rift headset, or you can have a Google Cardboard, like the one that you can see on the screen. VR is with us. And yet we're also living with the evidence of the Victorian and even uh, Georgian past. Now, the things that I'm showing you there, the view box, show box, and the um, Google uh, cardboard, these are examples of what Erki Huttemo, who's a, a wonderful collector of these gadgets, a Finn who lives in Los Angeles, has called Peep Media. And here you see with him with some of his collection of Peep Media, things you look into. Well, that's one kind of old new medium, but there were also projected media, uh, media which um, were projected onto a screen, the magic lantern would be the most obvious example of that. And there were panoramic media. And that's what we really are going to focus on this evening. And this is a book by Erki Gotamo called Illusions in Motion. It's a wonderful book, full of terrific illustrations. Erki has been collecting evidence of not just panoramas, but moving panoramas, which he is convinced are the ones that everybody's forgotten about. <laughs> He's probably right. Um, sadly, 
the reason why they're so unknown, I think, today, especially in Britain, is that we don't have any any longer. We really don't have any panoramas that you can go and visit. The buildings aren't here at all. There are quite a number in other parts of the world. Um, what we have are pictures. And this is perhaps the best picture of what the inside of a panorama looked like. And of course, the irony of this is that the panorama was actually invented here in Britain. So we've ended up without any. Um, it was Robert Barker, see him on the right there, painter, Irish incidentally, but he was based in Edinburgh when he first invented the, the idea of the panorama. He realised that the best place to show this off was going to be London. So he moved to London in the early 1790s and he built a building on the corner, the, the bottom corner of Leicester Square. And this is the best picture we have of what it was like inside. There's no plaque, by the way, on the wall. There's nothing that records the fact that, that um, he was there. But if you know Leicester Square and you're within striking distance of it, and if you go in past the Hippodrome on the, on the right over there, this picture, this is a, a, an 18th century, a 19th century picture, you will see a narrow building between the two big blocks. And that's what was the panorama. I'll just move the first one. You can see that was the panorama behind. And this was the entrance. And you can see it says panorama, the fall of Delhi, city of Lucknow. Oh, that's an, an historical reportage uh, picture that was showing at that time. Let's just fill it in slightly. That's a modern picture dropped in. That's what you see roughly if you're approaching Leicester Square from Charing Cross Road. And that very passageway is what remains of the panorama. There's a little bit more of it too. I'll mention a little bit later. There's a little bit behind there, which I think gives us an idea of what it was like. That's on the right is uh, a picture of the Paris panorama. Um, it's a double tower entrance. And that survives in a way that not as a panorama, but if you go to the Grand Boulevard and you'll see the Passage des Panorama, which is actually what remains of the, the uh, glass covered arcade that separated the two great panoramas in Paris. It's now a very fashionable um, interior arcade with um, sort of cafes and print shops and all sorts of things like that. There's more evidence of what a high value, prestige kind of location the panorama was in Paris than there is in its birthplace. So what was it like to be inside a panorama? Well, this I think is probably the best picture I know from one of the surviving panoramas. It's the Mesdag panorama in The Hague. So first stop, if you want to see a panorama is go to the Netherlands and go to The Hague and you will see really a very well preserved historic panorama from the 19th century. And that's the kind of effect. You're standing, leaning on a railing, looking out at a scene, which in all the panoramas that I've seen is incredibly convincing. In some panoramas, they actually rent you binoculars so that you can study details in the distance. They're very proud of the detail of the representation. This is um, panorama in Salzburg. Again, a very old panorama, although not the oldest. Uh, that still survives. So if you're on the way to Salzburg, you can check it out. This is from one that I have been to in a rather remote town in Quebec, saint anne de beaupre It's one of the major attractions. There's a cathedral and there's the, the cyclorama of saint anne de beaupre which uh, has now been turned into a Canadian National Monument, by the way. We, we all got together a few years ago to save the, the cyclorama in St. Anne de Beaupre, which was going to be demolished. Uh, but the Canadian government stepped in and is going to preserve it. Would that someone had done that in Britain when, when ours disappeared. And that picture gives you some idea of what it's like. The scene in St. Anne de Beaupre is supposed to be Jerusalem on the day of the crucifixion. So it's got a religious theme, as 
many panoramas had. And the detail is absolutely extraordinary. You can stand there on the plat viewing platform and you really do feel that in some sense you have been transported to biblical Palestine. This is a rather good image of another existing pan panorama. It's the, um, the Battle of Gettysburg. In um, uh, in, uh, sorry, it's the Battle of Atlanta uh, in Atlanta. And this, this you can visit also. Um, that's what it's like if you're there. You're on a viewing platform up, up at the top. And the Atlanta one actually seats the audience so that you are moved around and you inspect different parts of the panorama. One interesting detail, by the way, and you can see it rather well here, is that a, a, a panorama to work properly has some three-dimensional items in the foreground. You can see where I'm moving the cursor there? There's a real object. These are figures of soldiers. Uh, and what these do is to confuse the eye so that you don't see the join. You don't really see the point at which the floor joins the painting. The painting, of course, is vertical. Uh, the floor is flat. The objects are skillfully placed to um, confuse the eye and really give you that sort of three-dimensional sense. And I can tell you, it works. Now, we're going to use our imagination. Most of everything I'm going to show you from here on in is a flat illustration mostly period illustrations of material that would have been the content of London's panoramas and, and other optical entertainments. So this is a picture of the coronation of George IV in, uh, oh, I think I've said 1921. I think it should be a bit later. I think it's 1829, but I could be wrong. Um, not a very highly regarded or well-remembered coronation, perhaps. He didn't He'd been the Prince Regent, he didn't reign for very long afterwards, and of course we all tend to skip the Georges and move on to Victoria. So what you're seeing here is actually a document from the Westminster Archive collection, and it's a, a key to the image of the procession for George IV's coronation. So instead of that painting, which you just saw a moment ago, what you could do was go to the panorama in 1829 or so, and you could see a large colored image of the coronation procession, very much like seeing a newsreel of the event in many ways. And this is a key that explains in great detail who all the people that you would have been seeing were. So you'd be standing in the panorama and you would be um, holding this in front of you. It's a, it's a handbill and you'd be saying, oh, so that's that. Da, 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 da. That's how panoramas worked when they were showing detailed historical events. So what actually happens inside a panorama? Well, you've seen that image before. This is a more detailed version of it, which shows you that inside the original Barker um, panorama in Leicester Square, there were really, there were two pictures. Uh, there was a lower picture and an upper picture, sort of double bill. And you can see the staircase on the left over there where people are, well, I'm moving my cursor here, but I'm not sure if you can you can see it on your screens. Um, there are people going up the stairs, standing on the viewing platforms, two viewing platforms, and there are guides who are showing them around, who are telling them what to look out for. And if you look at guidebooks to London, and there were a lot of guidebooks to London in the 19th century, they will tell you how much it costs to go to the panoramas. Um, and they would say things like, allow about an hour or an hour and a half to visit the panorama, which I find eerily similar <laughs> to the length of time that you might spend going to see a film. So there is a kind of continuity between the idea of visiting a panorama and watching a film, which we're more familiar with. This is a, a recreation that's been done by um, uh, another archive um, of the original panoramic image that Barker showed off um, in his panorama. It's a panoramic view of London, the winter of 1790-91. And the detail, which you can see in this video, by the way, and Susie, I think, will post a, a link to it at the end, is quite fantastic. This is taken from a print, not from the original gigantic painting, because most panoramas, because they are huge pieces of canvas, were taken down, stored, ideally, 
most of them, almost all have disappeared, but prints were published uh, and sold, which were a kind of record of what the panorama had been. The success of Barker's panorama, of course, led to imitations. And this is um, a rather handsome building erected in Regent's Park, uh, the Colosseum. Well, it's called the Colosseum, um, which kind of evokes the big cylinder in Rome. But actually, the model is, is, um, is not the Colosseum. It's, it's uh, another Roman uh, amphitheater, as you will see. Um, and um, it's, the, it's the Pantheon in Rome that, that uh, was the model for the, the Colosseum. And this is a, a typical Regency print. This was put up in, in uh, 1823, um, I think. Uh, no, 1827. Uh, and it survived until 1875. So if you'd been in Regent's Park in the early 1870s, you'd have seen quite a lot of surviving buildings. This and another building I'm about to show you. <laughs> so this is some rather good images we have of the inside of the Colosseum. For some reason, the, the pictures that we have from inside it are really very striking indeed. And that picture on the right, I think, gives you a terrific sense of what it would have been like to be inside the Colosseum looking out on this panorama of London. The painting in the Colosseum, by the way, uh, was the largest painting ever made in Britain. Uh, and it bankrupted <laughs> the man who made it, who had to flee the country. Um, it caused a lot of financial problems, but it was a great spectacle while it lasts. It's worth saying, I think, that this was not happening in isolation, these gigantic um, circular paintings. They were happening at a time when there was a lot of interest in large paintings. And Perhaps the most famous painter of these massive uh, images was John Martin. John Martin had a show a few years ago at, at Tate Britain, when we had a chance at last to see some of his enormous canvases. This is just one of them, mostly biblical scenes. Um, this is Joshua commanding the sun to stand still. And it really is a huge painting. Um, I wrote a piece about it in the Tate magazine, which you can find online if you're interested. I've just borrowed my own title, Kings of the Vast, phrase that was used at the time to describe this, this vogue for enormous painting. The next development in this saga was the diorama. Um, the diorama was an invention uh, of the 1820s. So it follows 30 years after the first panorama. The diorama is a very interesting, very sophisticated device. You can see a diagram up there of what was inside this building. And if that rings a bell with anybody who's here in London, you will realize that the diorama building, at least the front of it, still exists. That's the only building evidence we have of this era uh, of, of entertainment. So what happens inside the diorama? Well, the audience is sitting um, in rows, and I'll show you a picture in a moment. And there are two scenes. That's why it's this funny sort of arrow shaped. And the audience is moved around so that they can see first one scene and then the other scene. Just like the panorama, it's about trying to make sure that there's, there's more on offer than a single image. And this is what happens inside the diorama. So in the, inside the diorama, the audience is, in this particular version, this is an early one, the audience is seated in rows and chairs, and you can see that there's a man behind the scenes there who is cranking the image so that it, it's unrolling, as it were. And he's also, well, to be more precise, he's cranking uh, the roof, flaps in the roof, which are moving, which are controlling the amount of light that falls on the image that the audience is looking at. So it's, it's a very sophisticated device that changes the light falling on the picture, which is on translucent gauze, and could give you the effect of moving from uh, day to dusk to nighttime. So there's a sense of moving through time as you're watching a diorama image. And let me show you the next slide. Uh, this gives you a, a sense. Yes, this was only discovered relatively recently, and it's a small painting by Louis Daguerre. Uh, 
of a diorama scene. And it really, it, I think it gives you a terrific sense of what the diorama excelled at. So this image would have transitioned from daylight to dusk, but it would also um, have given you a fantastic sense of you know, depth. As you look into that arcade on the left, you're really being sucked into the image. So the diorama is, if you like, a proto 3D uh, experience, even though at the time it was invented, the 1820s, actually stereoscopy had not yet been discovered. That came later in the next decade. The diorama was a, a very fashionable kind of entertainment. And what's striking is that there were lots of dioramas in London. I, I know of at least three, and there were probably more if we could find the playbills that advertised them. And they became <laughs> well known as locations to show off the latest fashions. What you're looking at there at the left is what's called a fashion plate by a very fashionable uh, tailor who would pose his models in the social areas of the diorama. And there are a number of these images which show extremely elegant Regency figures who are standing around looking fashionable in the antechamber, in the social spaces in front of the actual diorama chamber. One of the most successful dioramas was in Oxford Street on uh, the in, inside the Pantheon building. Uh, it's, that may ring a bell with some who are Oxford Street shoppers. Let's have the next slide. Yep, there it is. <laughs> the Pantheon still exists in a way. It's Marks and Spencer's on um, Oxford Street. And you can see right at the top there, it says the Pantheon. So I don't know exactly whose idea it was, but the, the historic link with the original Pantheon, which you're seeing on the right, and the modern M&S store has been preserved, at least as a title, if nothing more. There's one further chapter to add to this saga of the panorama leading on to the diorama. And that's what I mentioned right at the beginning. That's the, the moving panorama which uh, Erke Hutomo has done so much to, to resurrect. So the moving panorama was essentially a, a painting uh, on rollers. That's the simplest way of putting it, which could be unrolled uh, with an aperture to allow you to view the, the scene that is passing by you. And the most famous Component of the moving panorama in uh, London was Albert Smith. Albert Smith was a popular lecturer, and here he is performing in the Egyptian Hall. The Egyptian Hall was on Piccadilly. It's um, not exactly, it was more or less opposite the, um, the Royal Academy, uh, a little closer to, to um, Piccadilly Circus uh, on the south side of, of Piccadilly. It was a very famous venue for all sorts of displays. It was a kind of hall of curiosities and you can see a period picture of it, top left there. Um, they, it, it actually started life way back in the uh, 1820s, I think, with um, a display of uh, memorabilia gathered from Napoleon's reign. I think they even had his carriage on display after his defeat at Waterloo. After that, it had all sorts of things were displayed at the Egyptian Hall. And what you can see at the bottom left there is uh, another playbill advertising Mr. Albert Smith um, and the ascent of Mont Blanc. And then it adds on it Holland and up the Rhine. So really what you're getting from Albert Smith is not just his absolutely gripping account of the first ascent of the Mont, of Mont Blanc. And you can, if you look at the image that's on the screen in this engraving, you'll see that there's a line of figures snaking up the side of the mountain. Mont Blanc was then you know, considered to be a, a serious challenge for mountaineers. And Smith's lecture was apparently absolutely spellbinding. He did it night after night, day after day for years. And the place was always full. He was apparently a great performer. And this was his stock in trade. He made his name with the ascent of Mont Blanc, and then he added to it a kind of travelogue 
through Holland, up the Rhine, etc., using the moving panorama as a way of illustrating lecture. So the moving panorama is really about telling a story. It's about showing something in progress, whether it's a, climbing a mountain or um, traveling along a river. And the 1950s was the great era of um, moving panoramas. They were everywhere. The success of someone like Albert Smith and um, uh, others like him meant that the moving panorama was really one of the key uh, media attractions of the mid 19th century. In the 1850s, the 1860s, they were everywhere uh, in London, traveling around the country in Britain, and also they were very popular in America as well. So um, Susie very kindly gave me access to some of the collection of handbills that are in Westminster archives. And here are just two of them, which I picked out. These are handbills advertising moving panoramas. And you can see this is, this is really a terrific example of just how topical they could be. So one is the search for Sir John Franklin, the great Arctic exploratory story, which in fact was a, was a TV drama um, quite recently. And uh, it was wowing the Victorian audience uh, in the form of a moving panorama. And you can see right at the bottom of the screen there, uh, splendid moving diaphorama, people were always inventing names at that time, of the great earthquake of Lisbon. So mixing these to essentially put an event or a subject in motion was the great obsession of this period. Look at the one on the right. That's a, a grand moving panorama. If you think I'm exaggerating the uh, how prevalent these were in the mid 19th century, here's a punch cartoon uh, 1850 uh, the heading was the real street obstructions but just look at the <laughs> look at the background um, diorama panorama cyclorama dwarf Tussauds Madame Tussauds chamber of horrors bal masque monster concerts balloons going up firework displays this is the sense of the, the entertainment offer in London in 1850. As far as punch was concerned, you couldn't move for entertainments being advertised and for street performers like this uh, littering the streets. So I think it's, this is contemporary evidence of just how um, much these were a part of the, the, uh, the Victorian. The final chapter, in a way, of the cyclorama, diorama, um, uh, panorama story is what was called the Myriorama. This is the last Rama I'm going to, going to offer you. The Myriorama was a, a moving uh, spectacle. And you can see right in the center there, um, a very interesting diagrammatic view, which appeared in Scientific American in the later 19th century, showing the kind of apparatus used to convey the impression that you're on a ship. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that the Myriorama, with all its storytelling activities, and you can see some examples there on the right, that's a playbill of all the uh, spectacles you were offered by a Myriorama show. Concerts, um, the funeral processions, the Civil War in Chile, Niagara Falls, etc. you name it, they were all on show. There's a reference in James Joyce's novel, Ulysses, where um, Molly, Molly Bloom talks about seeing a couple canoodling while the, at, at the Myriorama. And it's suddenly we, we get an image of the Myriorama being a darkened space where you went and you did the kind of thing that you might do if you were sitting in the back seat of the cinema. It really, in that sense, is the precursor of an entertainment in the dark where there's a lot of action going on in front of you on the screens, but you're getting up to uh, personal business if you're in the back of the audience. Now, I've made a number of references to you know, what was coming next, and we all know only too well what was coming next. Uh, in fact, we tend to think that everything started when moving pictures, the cinema, arrived in the 1890s. It 
1896 in London. That image on the left there is a wonderful photograph that we happen to have of the inside of the Alhambra uh, Palace of Varieties, the music hall, which occupied the site now occupied by the Odeon Leicester Square. This was one of London's greatest, grandest um, uh, music halls. And it's in that theater that Robert Paul, the English pioneer, first showed his um, moving pictures in 1896. But the important thing to stress is that although you're looking at a very grand Victorian theater, the actual size of the image that he was showing was tiny. It had to be tiny. The light was not strong enough to project a big image and the image quality you know, couldn't be as big as we're used to seeing. So imagine that grand auditorium, but imagine a very small image occupying the center of the stage, back projected incidentally from behind um, the, the, the screen. So what I would want to suggest is that the memory of the panorama, cyclorama, the diorama, etc., lingered on into the early 20th century when movies were still quite small. And there's about a 10, actually 15 year gap between the arrival of moving pictures, which remain fairly small scale, and the coming of spectacle cinema. So the big films that, that put cinema onto a similar scale to the, the panorama and the diorama, films like Birth of a Nation from America, uh, and Kiberia from Italy, which was a huge event in 1914, same year as, as Birth of a Nation. These were the films that took cinema finally up to the scale that audiences had been used to right through the 19th century. So really it took cinema a long time to reach that scale. And of course, when it did reach that scale, it could deliver spectacle that exceeded what the previous media had been able to do. But it took time. And I would suggest that it was really the memory of the 19th century spectacular media that encouraged cinema to become as big and become as spectacular. And this is my last slide, by the way, <coughs> just to um, uh, arrive at, at the end and give us some time for, for uh, chatting, I hope, afterwards. This um, is really going back to the beginning. Um, this is a device which uh, premiered in the 1780s, even before the first panorama uh, opened a, a decade later. This is called the Eidophysikon, not a very catchy name perhaps, Greek inspired name of course. It was presented by Philip de Lutherberg, who was a scenery painter and indeed a great painter in his own right. If anybody saw the uh, recent um, Turner exhibition at Tate Britain, there were a couple of very fine paintings of naval battles by de Lutherberg. And one of the most famous paintings in the Science Museum collection today, the, um, the scene at Colebrookdale, with all the blast, the, the furnaces roaring into the night, that is um, a de Lutherberg painting as well. So he was a, a master of spectacle. But he wasn't content to just paint easel paintings or even to design scenery for uh, Garrick uh, at, in the theatre in London. He invented a device, the Eidophysicon, which he advertised as moving pictures with music and sound. This image that I'm showing you is the only authentic original image we have of what the Eidophysicon was actually like. So it's a window. Um, if you look below it, you'll see there's a harpsichord um, just beneath the window. So what we're looking at is a, a, a gauze, I think, giving onto a kind of stage behind. The harpsichord is supplying music. And we know from the programs, from some of the playbills that survive, that it, you've got a pretty good program at an Isofusicon show. You could have a shipwreck. You could have a scene dramatized from um, Paradise Lost by Milton. Uh, the scene was Satan conjuring the palace of pandemonium out of the, the, um, the underworld. And here we've got 
well, what have we got? We've got an audience, a rather kind of select, elegant audience who are sitting and standing and doing what audiences do. The man on the left is, is obviously chatting to the lady standing beside him because that's what audiences do in the dark <laughs> everywhere, if it was dark. And the man on the right seems to be looking through a device. It's not clear. He might, could he be looking through some form of telescope? I don't know. We just have the image. We don't have any really further details. And many people have speculated about what the actual um, experience of the Eidefusicon was, but it's certainly the first time that an, a moving picture entertainment was advertised in the newspapers. It ran in Lyle Street, which is along the north of Leicester Square, for a number of months, and then it was restaged a number of times. And it, it really is the precursor of the kind of 19th century entertainment that I've been describing during this, um, this talk. So if you want to find out more about um, the interface between these media and early cinema, that's my blog there on the left, uh, relating to Robert Paul and uh, other pioneers of filmmaking in Britain. And I'm doing another talk uh, at Bruce Castle Museum in, in Tottenham uh, at the end of this month, on the 29th, which uh, is called uh, Picture Shows Before Cinema. And I'm going to be talking uh, in more detail about things like the Eidefusicon and a number of other devices that were popular during the 19th century, which again lead up to the moment when film projectors appear and projected images start to move on the screen. So in some ways, that'll be like a, a, a counterpart to what I've been um, showing you now. So I'm going to turn on my camera again, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, that's my last slide. So I'm open to um, questions if anybody uh, wants to um, ask any. Let me try and... Uh... Oh, thank you so much for, for that, Ian. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we do have a number of questions already waiting in the Q&A um, and uh, please do keep them coming. Um, that was amazing. I mean, one of the slides that was on there that I think would uh, probably have shocked a number of people out there was the, the one advertising the uh, panorama of the slave trade, which, no. um, I mean, from first look, it seems rather shocking that uh, that should be a subject for entertainment. But, um, I mean, reading the description underneath, it says it's a depiction of uh, a slave escaping. So exactly. I don't know, do we know if there was any political stance to this, whether it would have been sympathetic to... Um, to the plight of the slaves, or I don't know how much is known about that particular panorama. I, I think almost nothing is known. I mean, we're, we're reduced to looking at these handbills, which is why they're so important. Um, and if you read them carefully, of course, you can often pick up, you know, a lot of detail. I mean, yes, in general, Britain, a lot of progressive opinion in Britain felt rather proud of the fact that Britain had moved legislatively to outlaw the slave trade. I mean, we know a lot more now about, if you like, collusion in the slave trade. It wasn't a, an open and shut case, as people were taught at school um, a long time ago, that you know, Britain outlawed slavery, and etc. But no, progressive opinion in Britain, and there was a lot of it, was proud of the fact that, that Britain had moved to outlaw the slave trade. And it would have been a popular um, story. And the brutalities of the slave trade were certainly widely discussed in Britain. After all, this is the era of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin was one of the most popular books of the entire 19th century. And, you know, almost everybody would have read it. And people would know that um, the horrors of life on the plantations and the, the treatment of slaves. So this was pretty widely known in Britain. Of course, there would have been different attitudes to seeing it portrayed in the uh, in the moving panorama but it does show you that the panorama market if you like was very alert to topicality and this was a highly topical subject right uh, we've got a question from Hilia um who says hello Ian uh wondering what you might know about the Thames Thames Tunnel uh Cosmorama that was between Wapping and Wotheride is that one you're um, familiar with uh yes I, I I'm familiar with it I mean it's interesting that, that as you know, and you probably gathered from this, that there, there's a, 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 an enthusiasm for marketing 
entertainments as um, uh, something something Rama. So it had, panorama was a newly made up word, by the way. Uh, Barker patented the panorama. Once he'd done that, people started adding ama onto everything, cosmorama, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it was a, it was a, it would have been a display. It was a display of pictures arranged in such a way as to enhance their, um, their visual effect. The big obsession from the panorama through the, the, um, the diorama and the cosmorama and all the other variations was how to get scale into these pictures, how to make them immersive by, if possible, wrapping them around the spectator or suppressing the light from outside so that you felt you were in the picture. And there were lots of different variations of it. I tried to kind of lay out the, the, the progression across through the century. And of course, the magic lantern is there too, giving you the same kind of effect as a projected picture. But it was the building-based spectacles, which we've lost today completely, of course, which I think really launched the whole trend. And these building-based things, building a building, which you could actually encase a picture in and bring the audience in and charge them at the door, was the real success of the first half of the, of the uh, 19th century. We've got a question from uh, Paul Baker, who says, uh, was the Linwood Gallery you showed us in one of the slides the successor to the panorama on the same site? Um, not, I think, I've been interested in this because when I looked at the, the Westminster um, uh, handbills, many of which are for the Linwood Gallery, of course that, I don't know, I haven't worked out exactly where it was in Leicester Square. It's in Leicester Square, but the Leicester Square of the um, late 18th and early 19th century is a constantly changing pattern of shows of all kinds. About uh, 15 or 20 years ago, when the center of Leicester Square itself was, was different from it is now, uh, there was a whole series of little busts and displays uh, which commemorated some of these very strange exhibits that were clustered around Leicester Square. It really was the hub of entertainment in London. And it, it's, there were two giant music halls, the Empire on the north side and the Alhambra on the, on the um, east side. But all around the rest of the square, there were lots of little rooms. It was a rabbit warren of small rooms, displays, uh, little um, galleries that were showing novelties, often freak shows of one kind or another. So the Linwood Gallery would have been one of those. And it's on my to-do list when I get back into... Um, the archives to have a look and establish just where it was. You, you make discoveries, that's the point. Looking at this collection of Westminster's playbills, I've got a whole list of questions that I'm now going to start looking for the answers for. Oh, that's great. We hope to see you in the archives very soon. We will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got a couple of questions. You mentioned before that um, the panoramas would often reflect current events. Uh, and Gwen has asked, uh, do you know how long it would have taken artists to create a panorama. And somebody else has also asked how long on average it would have taken and how many people would have been involved. That's uh, kind of the $64,000 question. <laughs> when you look at the scale of some of these panoramas, I mean, that, that giant cyclorama that I showed you from, from uh, Quebec, it is enormous. And we know that people worked on painting the panoramas in teams. So, I mean, it was, a, it was an industrial activity. Uh, somebody would, would make the initial sketch. Somebody would transfer the sketch onto the canvas laid out on the floor. There are some engravings that show people working on these giant uh, uh, canvases. And then there would be teams of, I guess we'd call them sort of, well, in animation today, they'd be called, um, you know, inkers or fill-in artists or in-betweeners, people who would actually work on the detail because it was a huge manual task to fill the canvas. And it seems extraordinary that people could paint so many canvases, but they did. And then there was the storage problem. What did you do with them when you had one up for three months, six months? The idea was to roll it up in a great sort of like a carpet roll and store it and maybe send it off on its travel so that it could be shown somewhere else and earn a bit of money. So people 
you know, were aware of the investment of time and effort that had gone and, and money that had gone into creating them. And they did tour, uh, tours of panoramas, still panoramas and moving panoramas were really popular. People would set off on the road um, with presumably a wagon train that would actually carry the, um, the panorama to a, a suitable building where it would be unrolled, stretched, set up and displayed yet again. There's a lot of moving things around right throughout the 19th century uh, to, because there was money to be made, taking them to different parts of the country. And, and that's true on an even bigger scale in America, because the distances were so great, many of these panoramas, particularly the moving panoramas, toured endlessly right across the States. And it does seem, the amount of work involved seems colossal. I mean, particularly those pictures that you showed us of the, um, of the workings, the inside workings of the Colosseum. Um, I mean, how did they actually go about designing them? Presumably there was some pretty complex mathematics that went into uh, uh, simply figuring it out and getting the scale um, of such an enormous painting, right? Well, yes. I mean, again, these are things which, um, you know, you, you, can, you can sort of hypothesize how it would have been done. You'd have used the same device that has been used since time immemorial for scaling up. So a small image could be scaled up by using a kind of pantograph, and then there would be systems for transferring it onto, using squaring probably, onto a much larger scale. So there are techniques that visual artists have used for centuries to, to scale things up. But yes, it, it was a real skill. And something I didn't really kind of stress, but which, which is interesting, is that there was a, a lot of um, aesthetic debate about panoramas. If you read into the literature, the modern literature discussing the history of panoramas, you realize that not everybody was in, in favor of them. Wordsworth, for instance, makes a number of rather uh, rude remarks about panoramas uh, in, in his writings. Uh, there's, a, there's a point in one of his poems where he actually makes some sort of passing swipe at the fashion for panoramas. And the author of a recent article suggests that maybe the problem for Wordsworth was that these were ridiculously popular. <laughs> and Wordsworth wasn't entirely happy about the, the, the mass audience turning out to gulp at panoramas. You can imagine a sort of, you know, a high class, aesthetically refined 19th century audience. Sort of Rus Ruskin, by the way, who was one of the great arbiters of taste, did think panoramas were really interesting and very educational. Wordsworth was obviously not so sure. So there were different schools of thought. There were different attitudes towards the panorama. What was clear was that they were popular. And so very often the attitudes were about, you know, was this a good thing that they were so popular, that they attracted, let's face it, a popular audience. Panoramas were trying on the one hand to attract a high class audience, and they stressed their educational value and their accuracy and their historical dimension and so forth. But at the same time, they were trying to get people in saying, you know, we will guarantee you a really good show. So they're, they're, do, they're walking the same kind of tightrope that showmen have walked, of course, for a very long time indeed, and which we know in our era through television and through cinema. But I was going to say also that, you know, we, I'm talking about things that appear to be essentially in the past, even large screen cinema, apart from IMAX, seems to be something almost of the past. But then of course, we're back to peep media. And I showed a picture right at the beginning of a VR set, two VR sets. I don't know whether people uh, watching this talk have ever experienced VR, but VR really is of course, what the panorama was aiming at. If you put a set of VR goggles on, you are totally immersed in the scene that you're looking at. In a way, that's what the panorama was trying to do. So maybe we, well, it, we have, in a sense, arrived at a point where we can achieve the panoramic immersion by putting on a headset. Um, and peep media, if you like, are coming to the rescue of panoramic media. That's one way of putting it. That's an interesting thought. 
Um, we have a question here from Gwen, uh, who says, I've been to Gettysburg, um, where they have a panorama in a room of the Civil War battle. Yeah. Are you familiar with it? And is it something like the ones you're discussing? So I, I don't know how similar that would have been to what the Victorian audiences would have experienced. Oh, yes, it is. It is. Uh, I've not actually been to the Gettysburg one. Uh, a very dear friend of mine who's, uh, who lived near Gettysburg and who died just uh, 18 months ago, always promised to take me to it. And he was very enthusiastic about it. He's an historian of early media and early cinema. And uh, he was, you know, very enthusiastic about the Gettysburg uh, panorama because it, America has got, as far as I know, essentially America has got the two, the Atlanta and the, the Gettysburg. And interestingly, they both relate to the Civil War. So if you like, the Civil War is still commemorated in these, you know, quintessential mid-19th century media which have been kept going because of, I suppose the Civil War is a, is a living <laughs> feature of, of American culture and, and history. Um, there are a few historic, much smaller scale panoramas that are in museums in different parts of America. And there are many other examples. I mentioned just a few at the beginning. There are probably several dozen panoramas still in existence in different parts of the world. The man I mentioned at the very beginning who really led the revival of interest in panoramas, Ralph Hyde. Uh, I went to see him um, 20 years ago and had a long, interesting interview with him uh, after his exhibition. And uh, he said to me, you know, panoramas are alive and well. People are actually studying panorama paintings. The further east you go, in the eastern part of what was then the Soviet Union, um, in Asia, People are creating panoramas. And he was fascinated, amused, I think, and fascinated that the panorama had refused to die. <laughs> it was alive and well, and people were creating new ones in China, Korea, elsewhere. So never say that <laughs> this is something that media historians uh, always say. There's no such thing as a dead medium. Media may go underground for a while. They may appear to be eclipsed by the next best thing, but old media have a habit of coming back. <laughs> and the panorama, the panorama effect, of course, we've seen it come back through IMAX theatres, which are really literally panoramas with projection. But the panoramas themselves as buildings may yet make a return, I think. Who knows? Oh, I'd love it if they did. It's, it's so sad that none of ours have survived. Um... Yeah, it's strange that they've been preserved elsewhere in the world, but uh, but none of the London panoramas, which is sad. Um, we have a question from Paul Baker. Um, he says, uh, you said the diorama building still exists. Can you tell us exactly where? I seem to oh, remember yes. there's a diorama theatre nowadays. So I don't, maybe, yes, do we have any yes. diorama theatres? It, it's the, um, let me get the orientation right. You, it, it's, in, it's at the edge of Regent's Park. I'm just trying to think whether I should, uh, if, if I had a handy map, I could show you, but you, you'll see the diorama, but it's in a terrace, a Georgian terrace, and it still says diorama on the front of it. It's, uh, it doesn't have any of the diorama apparatus inside it. It's just the shell of the building that survives. And there've been various attempts uh, in my lifetime to try to um, kind of reinvent it or to turn it into an art center. But as far as I know, when I last looked, it's still there. <laughs> and it's the only, relic, if you like, of Regent's Park, which once had both the diorama and the, the Colosseum, which I think must have been truly spectacular um, in it. Just on that question of buildings, by the way, um, if you go to Leicester Square and head north on the, on the right-hand side of Leicester Square, uh, up Leicester Place, um, near where the, the um, Prince Charles Cinema, the Prince Charles Cinema is on the corner of Leicester Place. You'll see um, a church, a French Catholic church, uh, as part of Leicester Place. If you go inside, and they're, they're very welcoming, they're very happy for people to drop in and have a look, you will see that, amazingly, it's circular. And there's a reason for that. The building is, the church is circular because it's actually built on the footprint of the original London panorama. Uh, when the panorama um, was closed and fell into ruins, uh, a priest was looking for a site for a, a new 
French church in London bought the site and used that site to create a circular church. And it was destroyed, or partially destroyed during the war, but it's been rebuilt very handsomely indeed. Uh, and I think, although I've got no evidence of this, that it's actually built on the footprint of the panorama itself. So if you stand in the middle of the church, half close your eyes and look up, you are effectively standing in a modern version of the shell of the original panorama. And I think it's a, it's a good opportunity for a kind of imaginative experiment to see if you can imagine what it would have been like being in it when it was you know, something like those images I've been showing you. That's the only link we have in London, not even a blue plaque. Oh, that would be a good experiment to try. That actually half answers the next question I was going to ask, uh, which was by Fiona, who said, um, can you say more about the buildings that house the panoramas? Were they purpose-built or were existing buildings adapted? Uh, but she goes on to say, um, if purpose-built, uh, were there architects, designers who specialised in designing buildings for a specific purpose? I don't know, were there, were there panorama architects, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> Not as far as I know. No, they were... Um, they. Of course, they had to have architectural plan. There are plans, and I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the moment at that, that sideways slice through the original panorama, which is appeared in 1801. Plans and in perspective with descriptions of buildings, excuse me, erected in England and Scotland. Uh, so it's an 1801 building, a uh, book, book of building plans. There were grand buildings. They were thrown up very quickly, as, as buildings tended to be in the, in the 19th century uh, and, and the end of the 18th century. Um, I don't think anybody ever got to specialise in them because they're always site specific. And one of the most extraordinary of these buildings, which I haven't mentioned just for reasons of time, was the, the Great Globe, which used to sit in the middle of Leicester Square. If you just look it up uh, on, on online, you just put in Great Globe or Mr. Wilde's Great Globe, and you will see the most extraordinary images of literally a globe, a gigantic globe, which sat in the middle of Leicester Square for 10 years. Um, and you could go inside it, and there was a system of walkways that led up through it. What you were really seeing was a kind of an inside out globe of the world. Um, Wilde, who put it up, had proposed it for the Great Exhibition of 1851. It was turned down by the committee, uh, who didn't think it was appropriate for the Great Exhibition to be in Hyde Park. So he thought, damn it, I'm going to build it anyway. <laughs> so he did build it, and it ran very successfully for just over 10 years in Leicester Square. It was one of the great visitor attractions. It was considered to be educational and spectacular. Now, I don't think we know exactly who built it, but there it was, uh, huge and apparently very stable. So the Victorians were great builders of really very ambitious buildings. Uh, and of course, as we know, many of those buildings survived, uh, even though they were intended for relatively short-term use, they survived until they were knocked down to make way for something else, or until they burned down, which was more common. But, you know, many of us live in Victorian buildings. I mean, I'm living in, in an 1880 house, uh, like many people in Britain. So we know that a lot of Victorian buildings, which were built with no thought of the future, have actually survived. Ian, thank you so much. Uh, that's been a fascinating talk and we have actually overrun already by about five minutes. So oh, well. I think we'll have to <laughs> we'll have to draw it to a close now. Um, but we do have, it's been such a lively Q&A. We've had some really, really interesting comments and people sharing um, experiences of panoramas that they visited. Okay. And we've had some, some lovely comments as well. I'm sorry that we don't have um, time to read them all out, um, but I promise that we will be sharing all of your comments with Ian um, after the talk. And, and thank you very much. It's been, it's been absolutely fascinating for me reading them as well and thank you so much for joining us this evening um i'm sorry about the few technical hitches this this happens with live events i'm afraid but thank you very much uh for bearing with us and thank you so much ian for such a fantastic talk Great pleasure. okay thank you. well that's all from us uh good night <laughs>